I mean, they're they're confident enough to let their gar- cars drive with no driver in the front seat around any parking lot you want. Um, and that crazy. shows, well, yeah, crazy. I mean, it honestly yeah. is. It's absolutely crazy. So walk us through that feature, you know, some, so, and, and then what's really cool about that is like the videos that are coming out of that actual smart summon is like, it actually looks like what has been promised forever, which is a Tesla driving itself without anybody in the driver's seat, which is like such an incredible sight to see, right? It's like, it looks like Waymo, but in a Tesla. So, so this is specifically for use in, in parking lots. So this is for those that are not familiar, a car, you can have a Tesla with actually smart summit park somewhere. And if you're somewhere in the general vicinity, it will come find you and it will come to your destiny to where you are so that you can just hop in the car. So what have you noticed with that uh, um, feature so far? Uh, I would say it's pretty incredible. Um, it's definitely like that is what you said earlier about um, it being promised a long time ago. And um, it's so true. It's I feel like this is what I said in the video. I feel like this is what smart summon should have been from the beginning. Um, and it's like typical Tesla better late than never. But um, it works really, really surprisingly well. Um, another thing that I mentioned is the old smart summon like on hardware three cars kind of just used its ultrasonic sensors kind of like a bug with the you know its antennas kind of feeling the world around it um and doesn't really have any logic but um this one definitely has logic where it's following the rules of the road it knows which way to go around roundabouts like if i if i give it an impossible destination um like down a one-way street or something it'll actually go around the block like there's actually a and this is all private property by the way it's like there's a place near me called the streets of brentwood it's a giant uh like outdoor mall but a lot of cool testing scenarios there um and the more i try to stress test it uh, the more impressed i get with it it still does have some awkward moments um like in one of my tests in costco i show on the video uh, I was literally trying to back out of its spot for over five minutes, just sitting there. And I was like force closing the app and reopening it because I figured it had to be some kind of like software problem. But no, it's just very, very cautious, um, especially around pedestrians. Anytime there's pedestrians near, I feel like it gets a little bit, um, it kind of gets a little bit twitchy. Like it just doesn't want to be near them at all. Um, but I feel like one area where it actually really shines is with other vehicle traffic. I've seen it pull some pretty confident maneuvers around there. So I would say, yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. Got it. Um, the, the pedestrian one, the, the pedestrian bit, I, that sounds to me and tell me if, if you think this is a good way of looking at it. Uh, you remember how previous versions of FSD, when you were on the road with pedestrians on the road or even on the sidewalk, FSD just was way too cautious with pedestrians where it's like it just it just freaked out when it saw a pedestrian, even if the pedestrian is like not in a path, clearly not in the path of the car or even in the same uh, surface as the car. They're just on the sidewalk walking or on the bike in the on the sidewalk. Right. Um, and then over time, as we got the new versions, uh, a lot of the hesitancy, at least from from my experience, has is is gone. It's like it, it's it it reacts way more naturally to pedestrians, and it's still very safe, but it's so human like in the negotiation of space with pedestrians. How do you think? Like, do you foresee a similar level of uh, like, I guess improvement or how it handles pedestrians in parking lot settings? Like, do you, are you getting clues with the current version that points you towards that direction? I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I feel like the biggest change that we had um, around pedestrian handling regarding full self-driving was with the release of version 12, the end-to-end -end network. That was when we saw, um, like, it almost removed the hand coding um, of like, oh, if a pedestrian is walking in the general vicinity, stop, you know, and it would do those things when it wasn't really necessary, where version 12 um, trained on just human data handles it way more naturally. It's able to kind of like guess way more accurately if the pedestrian is going to step out in front of you or not. Um, and with Summon, I actually do feel like there is some um, hand code in there. 
especially since we're receiving messages on the app saying like waiting for path to clear or waiting for pedestrians to cross and things like that, where we know um, that that's not really possible on the end to end network. That's why we don't have those messages when we're using full self driving anymore. It's because the end to end network can't explain what it's doing. It's just doing things. Um, and I feel like they have definitely tuned this to be as safe around pedestrians as possible because the second this like runs into somebody's leg, like it's going to be headline news all over the world. Um, so it's, I, I think it's probably, that's probably likely why we're seeing it so cautious. And honestly, it's the very first release. Um, and if you compare the way it handles pedestrians compared to the last smart summon, it's like a huge improvement. Um, and, you know, I say it's a little bit awkward sometimes, but it's nothing compared to what old uh, Smart Summon was. How I explained it in the video is um, I feel like old Smart Summon was embarrassing to use and really awkward about 80% of the time. And the other 20% of the time was like, wow, that was actually really good. But with those odds, you never really want to use the feature. You know what I mean? If you if you have those odds, you're not going to pull your phone out and be like, hey, watch this if, uh, if it's only going to work 20% of the time. And I feel like actually Smart Summon flips those odds where now it's doing a really, really good job 80% of the time. And I have like no issues with the way that it handled any of that. You know, it's getting through pedestrians, it's getting through vehicle traffic and it pulls right up to you, tur pulls over even, turns on the hazard. It's like, oh my God, that was incredible. And now 20% of the time it'll do some awkward stuff, which, you know, um, for a first release, that's, that's really incredible. Does any of the awkward stuff you mentioned, sort of the weird negotiation with pedestrians, which you feel like is hand coded, which honestly makes that makes a ton of sense. Uh, if I'm thinking about like the the jump from 11 to 12, the pedestrian handling was the was the neural net taking over and saying you you're being humans, you're being dumb. Just let me take <laughs> let me take it right. Maybe the confidence is not there yet with in a parking lot situation because of exactly what you described. Do you see any any of the awkward motions? Do they feel unsolvable? Do they feel like long tail type of situations? And you know, granted, you've had two days to test this, right? So you have limited data set. But like, help me understand how you're viewing the awkwardness. Is it do, is there a path to fix them from from your experience from using the, the software? Oh yeah, I would say for sure. Um, most of my complaints are about it being overly cautious. And I think that's a problem, like that's a software problem that can kind of be dialed back over time. Um, like when you watch the car drive, I know it has it in it. You know, when I showed that Costco clip where there was cars, you know, piling up in dense traffic, basically, and it was pulling out in front of these cars and kind of negotiating with other cars. Other cars were lurching in front of it and it would kind of stop and being like, OK, are we going to go here, buddy? You know, but it was actually extremely confident. Um, and I think it's possible to get that same confidence around pedestrians. But I just think for this first release, you know, they're putting a hard stop to that and being like, OK, if there's any pedestrians, any vulnerable road users in the scene, like don't do not do any of that stuff. You have no confidence. I can totally understand why that would be the case, but it does seem it does seem like there's a very clear path forward to start releasing some of these restrictions as far as like being, you know, the max speed being six miles an hour or um, slamming on the brakes anytime it thinks a pedestrian is going to walk out in front or things like that. So, yeah, I think I think dialing back is a lot easier than um, putting it out there and having to, you know, increase the safety because it does something bad. Like we're seeing, like, if you think about all the videos we're seeing of Smart Summon and how many people are using it and all the variables that happen in a parking lot and how good of a job it's doing, you know, that's, that's pretty incredible. And they, I think they've tuned it pretty much like, although I say that it's annoying sometimes, I think they've tuned it just right for a first release. When you took your uh, your Waymo ride, did that was that negotiating in a parking lot too, or was it just like uh, point to point on the street? Did you have any parking lot experience in the Waymo? Um, mine was on the street uh, in San Francisco, but it was so pedestrian densely packed that it might as well have been a parking lot. I don't think the I don't think the Waymo ever went over fifteen or twenty miles an hour the entire time, um, but. Yeah, I mean, in that Waymo ride, I felt very like some of the similar things going on where it would kind of 
lurch forward and the pedestrian would step out and it kind of breaks hard and kind of lurches more forward. You know, it's, uh, you can tell, um, it's trying to be ultra cautious and it kind of gives me the, the same impression, except obviously, you know, Tesla's only allowed to drive in private property where Waymo's allowed to, you know, go anywhere. I mean, not anywhere where, it, where it knows. So my question earlier uh, was on the roundabout video that you did. It really got me asking the question, how do you think they have solved this problem from a technical standpoint? Going back to the original smart summon, and like you said, it seemed like it was kind of feeling out the world with little bug tentacles and had no idea how to like play, plan long range. Are they able to solve that problem just with pure vision so that it can encounter any parking lot for the first time. It has no information about that parking lot and still just through using its cameras can kind of figure out what is the layout and how to make a long range plan. Or are they doing some sort of parking lot mapping exercise in the background and they're, you know, just able to crunch all the Google maps data essentially and say, okay, here's the layout of this parking lot. And, you know, these are the travel lanes. Um, what do you think is most likely given your experience with the software so far? It's kind of, it's kind of tough to say. I don't even know for sure um, what mapping service Tesla uses. I know that it uses Google maps to display the image, but I don't think it's actually Google maps running in the background. I think um, there might be like open street maps or something. But I also think with some of the stuff that I'm seeing in the parking lots, um, like mapping every single parking lot or private property place in the in the U.S. would be pretty difficult. So I think there has to be more going on than just like it knowing or it's following some maps or something. Um, but and there, I mean, I know I said that it, certain things are probably hand coded, you know, because we're getting those messages displayed on the screen. But there's other things like I mentioned where I put the pin in a in a concrete barrier, um, you know, that separates where pedestrian traffic is from vehicles. And if you, I looked at the the planned path on the phone and as the, as the car was coming, it was, it was constantly searching for a place to pull over. Um, and when it couldn't find a place to pull over, it had to go down a one way, a one way row aisle of cars and go all the way around the block to come get me. And it did that all by itself, you know, and you could actually see it searching for, for the correct path. Um, so, I don't know. It, it feels like a, almost like a weird mixture of like end to end and like some hand coding in there. I really hope we get to see more information about it. If there's another AI day, um, I don't know how too in depth they're going to be going on robo taxi day, but I hope we get another like look at how things are operating now that they've gone end to end. Cause I'm sure it'd be really interesting. I mean, ideally a show from Tesla watches a pot, this podcast and then comes on the show and then we can ask him ourselves. How about that? What do you think, Ashok? Yes? Okay, cool. I'm glad you agree. <laughs> Come on by. You already got two Tesla people here. Well, three. Let's let's put Hans in the crew as well. Let's just give him the honorary Tesla employee title because he, uh, you know, he knows everything so well. But um, okay, so that's that's very interesting to to think through. But it's still, I, I do, you know, you, you you still have to make the assumption that long term it will be just pure end to end. Like, do you, do you think there's going to be a world where they have to hard code stuff in to have, you know, to, to be able to do that long, long term? Or do you still feel like end to end will be able to solve for that? You know, I think we're going to have a much better hint of that when we um, let me just go back to this post here because we were going back to the um, the release roadmap here this month. Oh, no, just kidding. Next month, we're Let getting... Let pull it up real quick. Yeah. So in October, we're getting unpark, park, and reverse in full self-driving. So what that tells me um, is that the car is going to behave a lot better in parking lots starting with that release because that's like there's dedicated effort going into parking lots there. Currently, what we're seeing um, with parking lots, I don't think there's been a dedicated effort to like you know, have them, have them drive through there necessarily with some of the, you know, behaviors and obviously it can't reverse and all that stuff yet. But once that comes out, the, what I'm going to be looking for is, is this the same, like, as it pulls into the parking lot, is this the same end to end network that drove me here? Or is it like a different network that takes over almost like how 
uh, actually smart summon is a different network running within the car. Like it could just be extra cautious around parking lots. They could have two completely separate end to end networks running where it knows to switch over as soon as it goes into certain bounds or it goes off a regular street or something. Um, so I'm not really sure um, what that's going to look like, but I think that release in particular, when we finally see full self-driving shift into reversed and uh, in, in reverse by itself for the first time is going to be very telling. Yep. One of the things I would say on that is that, you know, even with an end to end network, you can still overlay something like navigation data and that, you know, it would basically be the same type of interaction that you have right now between Google Maps and a human driver would be something that you could have between your full end-to-end AI driver and whatever your navigation tool is that you're using. Um, and I think that navigation tool can be expanded to be used at least further out past just the road surfaces that uh, you know are normally mapped currently. One of the questions I did want to ask y'all, though, on that uh, on that post, if you want to bring it up, Farzad, is, you know, I was reading through all of that, and I noticed that it was very conspicuous that we have a bunch of hard dates for, or, you know, a bunch of hard milestones for September and October, and then nothing out until 2025. And, of course, the Robotax event is on the 10th of October. So... I was reading this to basically mean that these are all of the pieces that they would like to demo that they have not yet showed us on 1010. And I'm curious what y'all's reaction to that thought is. Uh, do I, you know, am I on the right track there or is there more going on? And um, how do you think this relates to 1010? So you're saying that this list will be the demo list for 1010? Or you, you're saying that 1010 will have Everything other stuff that they have Everything through haven't. October. Yeah, that this is all the all the things that are on this list are things that they have not shipped to customers yet, but they plan to demo them on 1010. Um, I think they'll definitely demo. I mean, they'll demo them or they'll or their or their mount or they will mention it that says, "Hey, now all Tesla cars in the fleet with hardware three and hardware four cannot do these things," but. I, I read it differently. I, I, the way I read it is because it's not like because after October, it's there's nothing else. What that tells me is like, hey, there is like stuff that they're going to release that they're going to show on 1010 that they're not going to include on this list. That is not it's it's like the next thing. And so that's how I'm reading that gap because it's 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 too coincidental now that you bring it up, right? It's like, okay, so November is a month later and you're giving us a bunch of like these very detailed things like, okay, so if version 13 is coming out in October, 2024, I'm assuming there's gonna be a version 14 because a version 14, I'm guessing will be the thing that perhaps takes you to uh, actual robo taxi and certain jurisdictions, right? Maybe, if, cause, cause if you really think about it, if, if, they're, if they're improving, uh, three times uh, between necessary interventions with 12.5.2 or 12.5.3, whatever it is. And let's say that takes the miles per intervention to, fi to 500 miles per necessary intervention, which is which is right around where the tracker is showing. Uh, if you just extrapolate that, and you assume that's correct. Then six times on top of that in October is every 3,000 miles, right? And then if you do uh, another, say, 5x on top of that, that's 15,000 miles. That's Waymo level. Okay. So it's like all of a sudden, if, if the exponential nature of the increase holds and all the training compute they're throwing up in the headquarters uh, correlates to that level of improvement, we, we don't know yet, but let, let's, let's we live in a world where maybe that's the case. Waymo, Waymo level reliability is like end of the year beginning of next year, right? And maybe that's 1010. Maybe 1010 is we have a very clear pathway to be just as good or if not better than the best performing self-driving car in the United States, which is Waymo. And this product, whatever they release on 1010, will be the 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 product that's going to drive home that point. 
because it's going to be very cheap to manufacture. We're going to be able to manufacture millions of them per, uh, of, of units per year. It's designed to be specifically a robo taxi because it doesn't have even have a steering wheel and pedal. Oh, and by the way, if you own a Tesla car today, you will also get this. You know, if you have hardware four and hopefully hardware three, right? That's I mean, that's how I read it. I could be, you know, it could be my usual optimistic self. But what do you think, JD? Um, I think they're purpose. Yeah, I think I, I agree and that they're purposely leaving a lot of things off of that list they're, that they're going to announce on 1010. I think they're being um, a little bit more secretive around full self-driving right now. Like, I don't know what's brewing in the background, but typically when we have full self-driving releases or uh, major releases, like actually Smart Summon, you know, we'll, we'll usually hear some murmurs about it. There'll be a leak a week or two before this and that. Like, this update surprised everybody. It just dropped all of a sudden. Um, you know, Elon wasn't hinting at this or that. And, um, <clears throat> now the, the timelines are being provided by the autopilot team and not Elon. Um, and yeah, I, I think that on 10, 10, we might see some stuff. It's, I'm starting to get excited. I'm starting to get excited. Like it's, we're, we're a little over a month away, but like that, I can feel the hype train move in. And I'm starting to get on it, you know, like it's, it's, it's something happening. <laughs> it's just, I'm just excited. And I feel like we've been in such a, um, you know, us Tesla nerds, like following this place closely. I feel like it's been kind of chill. It's been sort of like a, like the summer lull, like everyone's on vacation. It feels like, even though I know they're working their asses off in there, but it's just, we haven't had the level of like, um, you know, we've had this ramp up of, of news and excitement all through 2021, 2022, then Elon bought X and then. It, nothing like it like the whole thing about tesla sort of like died down the the next biggest exciting like the most exciting thing was Cybertruck, and then once that's you know that's been going great and everything but it's kind of like okay now we're all waiting for 1010 now the next thing you know is 1010 it feels like we're, we're getting close to it um let me show you the let me show the clip from carpathy here so andre carpathy because i think this is like a good tie into the what i want to talk about next is like okay so so do we feel like this is are we're still on a path for Tesla to solve self-driving in the coming months, right? Because that's that's the big outstanding question. It's, this isn't, shouldn't be like a multiple year thing. This should be like a multiple months thing now. If if for people that really want the story to come to fruition, I want to play this clip from Andre Karpathy. For those that are not familiar, Andre Karpathy was the previous head of Tesla AI. Uh, before he left in 2021, 2020, 2021, maybe. Um, I think it was 2021 or even 2022. I forget exactly when he left, but he left sometime around then. And um, here he is talking about the Tesla versus Waymo approach to self-driving in case you missed it. Um, and I want to hear y'all's reaction to this clip. Here we go. People think that Waymo is ahead of Tesla. I think personally Tesla is ahead of Waymo and I know it doesn't look like that, uh, but I'm still very uh, bullish on Tesla and its self-driving program. I think that Tesla has a software problem and I think Waymo has a hardware problem is the way I put it. And I think software problems are much easier. Tesla has a deployment of all these cars on earth, uh, like at scale. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Waymo needs to get there. And so uh, the moment Tesla sort of like gets to the point where they can actually deploy this and it actually works, I think it's gonna be, you know, uh, really incredible. Uh, the latest builds I just drove yesterday. I mean, it's just driving me all over the place now. They've made like really good improvements, uh, I would say, very recently. Yeah, I've been using it a lot recently, and it actually yeah. works quite well. So. It, was, it did some yeah. miraculous uh, driving for me yesterday, so mm -hmm. I'm very impressed with what the team is doing. And so I still think that Tesla mostly has a software problem, Waymo mostly hardware problem. And so I think Tesla, uh, Waymo looks like it's winning kind of right now. But I think when we look in 10 years and who's actually at scale and where most of the revenue is coming from, I still think they're uh, they're ahead in that sense. How far away do you think we are from the software problem turning the corner in terms of getting to some equivalency? Because obviously, to your point, if you look at a Waymo car, it has a lot of very expensive LiDAR and other sort of sensors built into the car so it can do what it does. It sort of helps support the software system. And so if you can just use cameras, which is the Tesla approach, then you effectively get rid of enormous costs slash complexity, and you can do it in, in many different types of cars. When do you think that transition happens? I mean, in the next few years, I mean, I'm hoping or like something like that. But actually, what's really interesting about that is I'm not sure that people are appreciating that Tesla actually does use a lot of expensive sensors. They just do it at training time. 
So there are a bunch of cars that drive around with LiDARs. They do a bunch of stuff that like doesn't scale and they have extra sensors, etc. And they do mapping and all, all the stuff. You're doing it at training time and then you're distilling that into a test time package that gets deployed to the cars and is vision only. And it's like an arbitrage on like sensors uh, and like expense. Yeah. And so I think it's actually kind of a brilliant strategy that I don't think is fully appreciated. And I think it's going to work out well because the pixels have the information. And I think uh, the network will be capable of doing that. And yes, at training time, I, I think these sensors are really useful, but I don't think they're as useful at test time. And I think you can, you don't. It seems like the one other thing or transition that's happened is basically a move from a lot of um, sort of uh, edge case design heuristics associated with it versus end to end deep learning. And that's what other shift that's happened recently. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and sort of what that? Yeah, I think that was there? always like the plan from the start, I would say, at Tesla, as I was talking about how the neural net can like eat through the stack. Because when I joined, there was a ton of C++ code, and now there's much, much less C++ code uh, in the test time package that runs in the car. Because uh, there's still a ton of stuff in the in the backend uh, that we're not talking about. The neural net kind of like takes uh, takes through the system. So first, it just does like a detection on the image level. Then it does multiple images, it gives you prediction. Then multiple images over time give you a prediction, and you're discarding C++ code. And eventually, you're just giving steering commands. And so I think Tesla is kind of eating through the stack. My understanding is that current Waymo is actually like not that, but that they've tried, but they ended up like not doing that. Is my current understanding, but I'm not sure because they don't talk about it. But I do fundamentally believe in this approach, um, and I think um, that's the last piece to fall, if, if you want to think about it that way. And I do suspect that the end-to-end -end systems for Tesla in, like, say, 10 years, it is just a neural net. I mean, the, the videos stream into a neural net and commands come out. You have to sort of build, to, build, up, build up to it incrementally and uh, do it piece by piece. And even all the intermediate predictions and all these things that we've done, I don't think they've actually like misled the development. I think they're part of it uh, because... Um, there's a lot of subtle reasons for this. So, so actually, like into and driving, when you're just imitating humans and so on, you have very few bits of supervision to train a massive neural net, and it's too too few bits of signal to train so many billions of parameters. And so, these intermediate representations and so on help you develop the features and the detectors for everything, and then it makes it a much easier problem for the end-to-end um, -end part of it. And so, I suspect, although I don't know because I'm not part of the team, but there's a ton of pre-training happening so that you can do the fine tuning for end to end. And so basically I feel like it was necessary to eat through it incrementally and that's what Tesla has done. I think is the right approach and it looks like it's working. So I'm really looking forward to it. If you had to started end to end, you wouldn't have had the data anyway. That makes sense. Yeah. So uh, you worked on- Instant reaction. Who wants to go first? The Hans is eager. Go, go. for it, JD. All right, JD, you both want to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, please, please go first. Well, yeah, I- Love Andre, and it's great to hear his structured thinking on this, even you know, now that he's been apart from the team for so long, but has so much of the foundational work that went into building what autopilot and the FSD effort has turned into. Um, I one of the big comments that stuck out to me is one that I have understood, but I, I guess I've never thought about it in a way that. I have articulated well to other people, and that is the fact that they do use LIDAR at training time. And what they use it for is to make sure that the cameras are able to essentially reconstruct a, a LIDAR-like feature space around the car where they understand the three-dimensional shape of everything that they're encountering just from cameras, not necessarily from LIDAR. And so they can create essentially a virtual LIDAR that is just camera sensors plus some neural net code that provides the software with the same information that they would get out of a LIDAR if they were to have it. And so that's why you do see, you know, in Palo Alto or around, there'll be these engineering vehicles that have LIDAR strapped to them and they're going around and they're doing some mapping. And what they're doing there is they are essentially training on that specific and they'll do it with every single new. So when we see, uh, you know, Model Y Juniper refreshes driving around, you will see a Model Y Juniper with LIDAR. And what they're doing there is they're going to be validating that. I think recently we saw a Tesla Semi driving around with LIDAR. We've seen it in the past with the Model 3, the Model Y, the S and the X. Um, I don't know if we've ever seen a Cybertruck, but I'm assuming that they have done it. And maybe the fact that we haven't seen it is part of the reason that we don't have uh, FSD in Cybertruck yet. But <clears throat> that is part of the process that they're using. Now, to back out um, of just that 
narrow thing, his broader comments about Waymo versus FSD is, you know, they, they really have not only the hardware problem, but like he was talking about with them, not to his, the best of his knowledge, not pulling away from using heuristic code. Like I just do not fundamentally believe that this is a solvable problem in a generalized way that they will never be able to scale from San Francisco and Chandler, Arizona to the entire United States. Like they may be able to pick one more city and over the course of a couple of years, they can add one city. And then over the course of another couple of years, they can add one more city. But unless they, regardless, even if they want to use the same hardware stack that they have, that's fine. If they can't solve this with end-to-end -end neural networks, then there's no way that they can scale. So they have to do two hard things. They have to move from heuristic code to software 2.0 code. And then they have to move from this expensive test time hardware to cheaper test time hardware. And that's what, um, you know, they don't have their, they need to have a lot more hardware on their vehicles in real time because their software sucks. It's a crutch. And, but that kind of is a self-reinforcing negative because that means that they can't put enough cars on the road to generate the data that is necessary to have better software 2.0 code that you don't build what Tesla has built without having millions of cars on the road. And you can't put millions of cars on the road when they cost $150,000 each and you have to hire an engineer to drive them. And, but you know, the reason that you have to have these expensive engineers and these expensive cars is because your software sucks. And so this is, you know, I think it just highlights the, core advantages for the long-term scalable version of autonomous driving software that eventually, you know, blankets the entire earth. Um, and the, there was one more little snippet from that conversation that Andre Karpathy made that I think is very illuminating here. He said that Tesla is not just a robotics company. He said, it's a robotics company. It's an AI company, but more than that, it's a AI robotics company at scale. And he said that that at scale piece is even distinct and like just a higher level than like, you can be an AI company, you can be a robotics company, you can be an AI and robotics company. And that's more than either being an AI company or a robotics company, but then being both an AI company and a robotics company and doing it at scale in the millions and millions of units per year is a whole nother beast. And that's what Tesla is focused on. And I think that's why, um, you know, it, it's a longer road. It's a harder challenge to solve that problem than it is to do what Waymo's done. Uh, but once you have solved it correctly, you do instantly go to scale. JD. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I want to say it, it was really interesting seeing that full clip of uh, Carpathy because I've seen little bits and pieces of it, but hearing it all um, really puts it together. But yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, no, I mean, I'd, uh, what Waymo's done is incredible. Don't get me wrong. Like they, um, they have driverless cars on the roads right now. And that's why to um, the regular person who doesn't really care about the technology, Tesla looks very behind. One company has driverless cars and the other does not. Um, but when you really start looking at it, um, <clears throat> Tesla's work everywhere. And that's the, the biggest difference is that Waymo cars only work on the areas where they have super high definition maps. You know, uh, we have actually smart summon going around any parking lot you want in the U S where Waymo has to map literally every inch of that parking lot and use LIDAR sensors to make sure that it's in the correct spot and it's not going to, you know, run into anything. And even with that, it still has some issues. You know what I mean? Where they went through an area and LIDAR mapped it and they installed a new telephone pole there and it smashes into the telephone pole. Um, and those are, you know, you have to constantly update these things and constantly there's huge development effort, uh, going into making these cars work the, the way that they do. And it never stops because the world never stops changing. Um, and 
they are going the path where they're trying to remove some of the sensors. Their next, their sixth generation Waymo vehicle has less LIDAR um, and less expensive sensors, and they're trying to do a more cost uh, effective approach. But, you know, riding in one of those things is fairly expensive um, and they're still losing a ton of money all the, all the time. They're, they're not even close to being profitable. And if Tesla can come along and, you know, like, I saw some like green, the only that, uh, you know, the, the Tesla hacker guy went into some of the code and found out that they're, um, you know, the whatever studio they're going to host the robo taxi event with, they have a flag in that area where any, de- any Tesla that um, allows data collection on it, where you have that check mark checked is sending Tesla data in that area. And if they like, I think, if it like, I think if they just put all that data into the the model that already works so well and say, Hey, like this, this is how easy it is to get this working in this particular city. You know what I mean? We can just add all this data and then it's done. Um, that's the, the biggest difference be- between the two where, um, one is one can be rapidly expanded. Like once, once uh, autopilot or FSD or whatever works really well, it's very easy to expand and expand and expand. Where Waymo, just like you said, it takes years to get to these new areas. And even when they are um, driving in these new areas, you know, we've seen a lot of pain points, especially in the areas where they first launch in, of the cars doing some really, really wild things um, because they have bad data or the roads have changed or it weren't they weren't exactly like they were before. So... Uh, how I've always envisioned it is um, it reminds me a lot of approach of like um, like an NPC out of a video game, right? Like if you walk in front of a car in Grand Theft Auto, it'll go around you and you can say, wow, that's like pretty intelligent that it did that. But like not really. If you drop that car onto a real road in real life, it can't move an inch. And that's the exact same situation uh, Waymo is in right now. I saw a video posted, uh, Waymo posted, I think uh, yesterday or the day before, it was uh, some safety things that happened where it was dodging really bad human drivers and really impressive stuff, like braking immediately doing all this stuff. And the comments are all like, wow, like, why isn't this expanded everywhere? The world needs this. And it's because they can't. Like it literally, they, they can't, they, they can't just, you, you drop that car off anywhere where it doesn't have an HD map to rely on. It will not move an inch. It can't like it literally cannot. And that's the, the biggest difference is we have Tesla's driving on like every street in the United States on full self driving. And yes, it still has issues here and there, but it seems to be, um, especially with the progress we've seen over the last year or so, I think that there's a very clear path, um, to leapfrogging Waymo. I mean, I'm going to make this statement and I don't want to jinx it. So I'm going to knock on wood. How long has FSD 12 been on the roads and how many, uh, like true, um, disastrous events have we seen from the software? Like where something terrible has happened outside of a couple, you know, like there's videos of people clearly like taking over the wheel when it's doing something really dumb, you know, but again, I'm hoping not to jinx it, but I think the the reliability of the software within its constraints i think is showing just how advanced this thing is and then the awareness of this delta that we just talked about between waymo and and tesla where one of the leading people in ai he might be biased because he worked for tesla and obviously he views tesla very positively and i'm sure him and elon are, are buddies but but they're if you're if you're at the for you know and he worked for ChatGPT for Elon Musk's sworn enemy and Sam Altman so this individual probably is a, is a lot more unbiased than uh, I think some people might give him credit for unbiased but when this individual is saying that Tesla is much farther ahead than Waymo because of that scale factor which is something a lot of us have been talking about right and then you couple this with the fact that just something and this is like. I know this is like a different thing, but I just want to talk about like how little awareness there is. Then you have Time Magazine coming out and not even listing Elon Musk as one of the leading AI people, right? And then you're like, okay, so nobody knows that still to this point, nobody knows this is happening. Like there's a lot of alpha, right? There's a lot of like, there is a total misunderstanding of the progress that's being done on this front, which reinforces the point that this this breakthrough with full self-driving 
is probably going to be the very first time an AI product is actually profitable. An AI product, like a product that's driven by artificial intelligence, that's physical, an AI product, I think full self-driving will be will be the first iteration of that. Uh, you know, we've seen ChatGPT, we've seen a bunch of other stuff. It's tough to say if they're even profitable, any of these AI companies call it. I think this is where full self-driving is really going to have the opportunity to shine. And yeah, it, we're all waiting with, uh, you know, with beta breath. It's like, okay, so, but, but when, 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 you know? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Do, has your uh, has your expectation for ten ten changed at all since the last time we talked, JD? Or are you still expecting them to sort of release a couple products and, um, like how has your sort of the way you're viewing that event has that morphed at all since we last spoke? Uh a little bit. Um, the the data collection in the mile um, mile radius of where the event is happening is extremely interesting to me. Um, like, I think if they were to be confident enough in, I mean, we're, what we're seeing right now is nothing compared to what's going on in the, the background. You know, Elon was talking about 12.5 months and months and months ago. Um, you know, when we were on, you know, the original version 12. So what, what they're working on right now, we have no idea, but I think, um, if I'm not saying that they will do this, but like if they did just offer a bunch of driverless rides at the event, I think that would be a pretty like mic drop moment. Like we're like, we're, we're showing you that this approach does work. Um, I think that would be pretty incredible. Um, I also think there's other things that we need, like, like I just, this is the same thing I said last time, but there's other things that I think they need to do. Uh, Tesla maps is a huge one. Um, where, you know, they, they need the vehicles to communicate together. If a car gets stuck, it needs to communicate that to the rest of the fleet. And what better way to do that than have your own mapping service that will be the most accurate map on the planet, basically, because of how many Teslas are out there. Um, so I'm really hoping that we see, um, like, to me, the, the actual robo taxi itself is the least interesting part of the event, because we know Tesla can build something like that fairly easy and probably produce them in large quantities pretty easy. But it's getting the product working um, is what I'm excited to see. And I want more technical details of how they're going to make that possible. Like, obviously, with the progress that we've seen lately, it does feel more and more possible. I mean, they're, they're confident enough to let their gar cars drive with no driver in the front seat around any parking lot you want. Um, and that crazy. shows, well, yeah, crazy. I mean, it honestly yeah. is, it's absolutely crazy. Um, and you know, which that, is that tells where me the majority of accidents happen, like more yeah, accidents exactly. happen in parking lots than happen in on the streets. Exactly. And they're confident enough to just ship this and be like, okay, wide release next week. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and people are just, um, I, 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 uh, I think things will change once people actually start to see um, driverless cars in parking lots, you know, like some of the reactions I got were just hilarious. Like people were just like, wait, what? Like they're like, they're dumbfounded. Like they have no idea. Um, so yeah, I, I think that the majority of the people just don't care about the technology going on behind the scenes. And, um, just like Carpathy said, like Tesla looks behind because they still have a driver in the seat, but you know, if they, all they got to do is restrict where it's able to drive. And I think they have a pretty killer product on their hands and then, you know, just expand from there. Yep. Go ahead. Just to drive home Andre's point a little bit about the software problem versus the hardware problem. Explicitly what he's saying is that, you know, if, if Waymo solved their software problem that they have to perfection today and it could like say they they knew exactly how to just drive anywhere and map anything well they still don't have a fleet of cars that can take advantage of that better software and it would take them many 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 years in order to match the same number of cars that tesla has on the road today versus you know if tesla can solve their software problem then all of a sudden they already have all this hardware that 
is everywhere. And, you know, they instantly, you know, can turn on millions of cars and turn them into robo taxi. So that's, I think that's what Andre is saying when he talks about Waymo's hardware pro or Waymo has a, yeah, a hardware problem versus Tesla has a software problem. So, um, so every step change in performance uh, improvement requires the spooling of a brand new production system. Basically, right? So, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that was the that was the end of my point there. I have a question later, but if you want to keep going on that no. line of thinking, no, I'm Farzad. Good. Okay, so my other question is, you know, do you think that it is going to be necessary, and I'll, I'll pose this to either or both of you, um, for there to be some sort of a maybe not high definition map, but say standard definition plus map, kind of referencing what you're saying, JD, on needing to do Tesla maps in order for there to be a robo taxi network that is operating. So like, say, you know, Tesla wants to roll out and they're going to start in five cities. Do they have to have Tesla maps in all five of those cities before they can begin operating a robo taxi network there? And what are those, like what level of detail is required in those maps? You wanna go first? Eddie? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't think, I don't think it's necessarily necessary, but I think it's extremely helpful. Um, you know, your, your first time driving through San Francisco um, is very, very stressful. There's a lot of streets that don't make any sense. There's um, lane markings that go left and then it turns into a right-hand turn only lane and you got to cross over here and cross over there. Blind um, corners everywhere. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but knowing about those things in advance makes it a lot easier to navigate. You know, a taxi driver there doesn't even think twice about that stuff. And that's what I'm hoping that these maps will do. And to be clear, um, like the, the last AI day, we saw a bunch of cars, a bunch of different Teslas with all their cameras driving on the same streets. And it brought together this beautiful map with all the lane markings, all the, the lines here and there, all the paths that the cars could take. And they just instantly stitched that together. Um, and I think if that was applied over an entire city, it would be so helpful for full self-driving because it would just drive around like a local because it already knows what's ahead. Um, you know, obviously vision will override that, you know, just like humans do, you know, if a construction flagger is telling you, Hey, this is a left turn only lane, but you're going to go straight because we're working on it. Like it has to be able to do that. It shouldn't rely on those HD maps, like some of the current, um, current cars, but these maps, like even if it mapped out all the, the borders and the drivable space versus non-drivable space and has all that, that is a super low resolution map compared to what Cruise and Waymo use. Um, Cruise and Waymo are literally like it's down to the millimeter. Those LIDAR spinning around all the time are making sure that the car is on the exact path that they want it to be um, with no deviation. And that's um, and I think with just a low definition map where you just kind of know what's coming up in the future, I think, um, like I said, I don't know if it's necessary, but I think it would be extremely helpful. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree 100 percent. I think to launch, they won't need it. But I think over time, they'll just end up using it because it gives you a much better experience. Just uh, just a, as a as a customer, if I think about like long term, what's going to be the differentiator between self-driving platforms is number one is going to be cost. Number two is going to be experience. Right. I think I think Tesla's positioned to do both really, really well because of that, because they're of their ability to refresh the the map or the the space where they drive literally every day you know and where and where is this most uh helpful uh definitely in places where they have heavy construction and a lot of construction work in the city but like in the northeast potholes potholes are it's a scour job i mean it's bad it, it's it's a bad situation in the northeast when it comes to potholes uh PA, New Jersey, Ohio, like uh, New York, all these places, anywhere where they get snow. And if you're able to, if if this, so, so, so you know, high definition map plus or whatever you want to call it, that is based on vision, is able to locate all the pothole locations, then what, what, ends, up, what ends up happening is that Tesla can automatically, uh, after each snowfall, <laughs> okay, 
it can it can give a better riding experience to its customer base because it's able to not just uh, find the potholes, but also identify the potholes. So it maybe doesn't need an immediate refresh. It, it, it says, I've seen a thousand of these potholes already. I know the where these should be, but oh, look, there's one here that's missing that looks like a pothole. Avoid it and then send the data back to the, 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 the mothership so they have it. Oh, and by the way, partner with local governments, send them the data of every single pothole that exists on your roads maybe sell it to them for a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, or whatever, a quarter or whatever, and then they go and fix the fucking potholes, right? It's like the value add from this thing is insane. So yeah, and, and yeah, I, I don't it think it's necessary to It would be easier for launch. Tesla to make their own robo pothole fixer than to Dude. get the government to actually fix them. Facts. And you should do it as like a, uh, I bet you, that's such an interesting question, right? Because, or interesting statement, because What's what's the what's the benefit you gain from that? Number one, you make the news because everyone's gonna love you. Be like, oh my god, there's all these optimists filling in the potholes, and it costs the taxpayer. It, it, Tesla just foot the bill, right? And so, what are people gonna say? I'm gonna support Tesla because this is the best thing ever, right? And but what's even better is that their customers are just gonna be happier because you're not gonna be freaking every two seconds. You're not gonna be in a car that's like you know you freaking. You give yourself a herniated disc on your spine because the pothole is so crazy, right? Um, and it and it becomes really cheap to do because labor with a human or robot. And this is where th this whole thing breaks. This is where, the, where, the, where this whole thing breaks. You know, we were talking, JD, on, on our last podcast or the one before about you know the the uh, concept of you know, you know, could universal basic income be everybody gets a robot in in a way like our government's going to fund like a program where everybody's going to get a, a bot, you know, in the future, because that is truly the thing that's most valuable to people. It's like you free up their time. You free up their time to pursue what they want to pursue. Right. Um, and then my, my, my head goes to, okay, so if you free up the time for people to pursue what they want to pursue, and if I use myself as an example of, you know, I have a child now and I'm paying way too much attention to what's going on in the world and I don't like what I see. <laughs> How many more people are going to be inspired to go out there and improve the world because they actually have time to analyze what the hell is going on and what are the things that need to be fixed, right? Um, yeah, anyway, I just wanted to like mention that because it's like, it gets weird. No, yeah, the, the Tesla bot thing gets super, super weird. Um, I remember like, and it, nobody understands it even like tesla people i remember making a post um you know everybody's like oh tesla should do wireless charging you don't have to plug in the cars or, or else they're never going to be able to launch robo taxi i'm like they could have an optimus bot at every supercharger whose only job is to plug in the cars and it's problem solved you're like that'll be so expensive they'll never do that and it's like you have to 20 understand. grand <laughs> yeah exactly even if it's double that cost like you're, you're talking about how much would it cost to have a, a person there work, you know, three people working there uh, all, all day and night, three shifts, like expand that out over a year. The Optimus bot will pay for itself in a few, like a month or two. Um, and people really just don't understand um, what that'll do to the, the economy when those kind of, or just like you said, when you see a bunch of Optimus bots filling in a pothole, no risk of human life, you know, it's like, it's crazy. It's honestly crazy. Yeah. Like it's, it's tough to think about humanoid bots because it's so it's like, it's almost like alien to me um, thinking about it and how that's going to change the world. But yeah, one thing I can say for sure is nobody understands based off like even Tesla people, the way the comments that I got on that post that I made about Optimus plugging in cars, which I think would be just the easiest job ever. And such, so all he's doing is walking around and plugging in cars. Be great PR for Tesla, you know, be like, Did you oh just my gender God. the bot. You just gender them. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Wow. Bot. Yeah, they're, they're going <laughs> to watch this in the future and it'll become a Terminator situation. <laughs> Go ahead, Hans. Sorry. It is bot. Uh, I yeah, I don't even know what the right gender. Something for Bay. <laughs> <laughs> he said he said he, JD said he, and I'm like, oh my god, you just gendered the bot. Sorry, I didn't mean to. The, were you going were you going down a path of of? I didn't want to interrupt you. Sorry, JD. Was there anything B else? B and to Bim say? for bot. Yeah. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Hans. 
Um, shoot, I forgot what I was. Oh, uh, one of the things that did pop up, you know, a lot of people last time we talked about everyone getting a bot assumed we meant that the government should be the one giving out these bots. And I, I just don't think that that's how that's going to work. I think that the makers of the bots at some point just give them away to people because then there, there's a number of reasons for that. But yeah, I, I think this will be, you know, Elon will have so much money. He'll be like, here's, you get a bot, you get a bot, you get a bot. But walk me through the logistics of that. Like why, what's, what's the incentive behind doing that? Goodwill of the people. That's the, the main one right there that you don't want, you know, what's the best way to keep yourself from getting a lot of political pushback against your company. You just buy them off with the uh, robot services. <laughs> How is that any different than politicians getting bought off <laughs> by special it's interests? It's the same. It's just you're a disintermediate. You don't have to give the politicians money to get your way. You just give it, to, you know, all your stuff straight to the people. That's crazy. Go Cutting ahead. out the yeah. middleman. If they can't get full self-driving on hardware three figured out, they'll just send a bot to go drive the car around. <laughs> It's cheaper to put a bot in the front seat than replacing the, the the brain and the cameras and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when I think about the bot, it's like, okay, so if, if this thing's really going to cost, you know, when it's fully ramped up, like ten to $20,000 to make per unit, you know, like probably early generations, probably closer to 50 to 100K, whatever that number is, right? Which they're going to use internally. They're going to they're gonna start by, you know, using it. Actually, uh, Karpathy was talking about this too on his video. Um, and I haven't had a chance to watch did you guys watch the the Karpathy um bot piece or no have you guys watched only that a, or no only a small clip i feel like the ones okay. you have are give a lot more context yeah from the it's same about, interview from the same interview yeah 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 i listened to the whole thing okay is it i is it okay if i, if I play the clip just because since we're on topic i know he talked about it i haven't had a chance to listen to it yet so that's i kind of just like my live reaction to this thing um so here we go so uh you worked on the um tesla humanoid robot before you left uh i have so many questions but one is like starting here what transfers basically everything transfers and i don't think people appreciate it okay um <clears throat> that's a big claim it's, i think it's like a very different problem basically robots when you actually Everything transfers from Tesla FSD to Tesla bot. Actually, uh, look at it. Um, okay. Cars are robots. And Tesla, I don't think, is a car company. I think this is misleading. This is a robotics company. Mm -hmm. Robotics at scale company. Because I would say at scale is also like a whole separate variable. They're not building a single thing. They're building the machine that builds the thing, which is a whole separate thing. Um, and so I think robotics at scale um, company uh, is what Tesla is. And I think uh, in terms of the transfer from cars to uh, to humanoids, it was not not that much work at all. And in fact, like the early versions of Optimus, um, the, the robot, uh, it thought it was a car, like because it had the exact same computer, it had the exact same cameras. It was really funny because we were running the car networks on the robot, but it's walking around the office and so on. Oh, amazing. And like it's trying to like recognize drivable space, but it's all just walking space now, I suppose. But it actually kind of like generalized a little bit and there's some fine tuning necessary and so on, but it thought it was driving, but it's actually like moving through an environment. Is a reasonable way to think of this as like, actually it's a robot, many things transfer, but you're just missing, for example, actuation and action data. Yeah, you definitely miss some components, but, and the other part I would say is like, like so much transfers, like the speed with which Optimus was started, I think to me was very impressive because the moment Elon said, we're doing this, uh, just people just showed up with all the right tools and it, all the stuff just showed up so quickly and all these CAD models and all the supply chain stuff. And I just felt like, wow, there's so much in-house expertise for building robotics yeah. at Tesla. And like, it's all the same tools and they're just Can like, okay, they're being right reconfigured there? from a car. It, like a Yeah, go for it. So, you know, I've heard this statement by Andre several times in the past, but you know, and I, I don't want to claim that I worked at Tesla, even though I, I do understand a lot. I feel like it's stolen valor for me to say that, yes, I'm an honorary Tesla employee. Um, yes. <laughs> so I'm going to ask the actual two Tesla employees what it sounds like I'm hearing is former that now I'm going to get a bunch of people. Oh, you see, you're getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So the two former Tesla employees, it, it sounds like what I heard there was there's a bunch of people who work at Tesla and they had job responsibilities that were over here. 
And then one day Elon says, hey, we're going to make an Optimus bot. And then a shit ton of people just decide my job is now Optimus bot. Whatever I was doing before, that's not my job anymore. Like a self-organizing selection of employees who are like, my bot is now lead Optimus development engineer, and I'm going to just leave whatever I was doing behind and it doesn't matter anymore. Goodbye. Like, is that what happens? Loosely. So, so what the, my experience is, so, so the project is presented to a team of people that are across multiple different areas of expertise. And then those individuals propose their ideas on how to solve for that and the best ideas win. And then that person now works on that. And then we figure out how to fill that gap. Uh, JD, I don't know if you want to. And there's no HR yeah. people that are in the loop of like, no, like we need to hire for this team instead of that. No, team. no. And you just tell HR like this is what happened. And they try like, OK, yeah. the way I think of uh, where I worked at Tesla is there's it's not just one giant company with different aspects to it. Like, oh, this person's quality. This person's an engineering. This person's here. Like it's all just mini startups working together. So um <clears throat> like our team got pulled into meetings for completely different areas than our expertise on just to see if we had ideas for how to do certain things. Um, and there's not a lot of boundaries between teams. Um, you know, there's a lot of like walking up to people's desks and be like, Hey, let me just run something by you real quick. Um, and there's not a lot of separation in that aspect. And if I use like a, as a hard and fast example, so, me and my team are in, were in charge mainly for analytics, creating dashboards and KPIs for the distribution network. But I can't tell you how many times we built processes uh, that industrial engineers would traditionally be in charge of, but we took it on because we're like, why aren't we doing it this way? And then we're like, hey, this is a better way of doing it. And then before you know it, you're in a meeting with the head of supply chain explaining what that process improvement looks like. And then you get, tr he tries to chew you out for 45 minutes. Uh, and then you're like, no, I, I've already thought of all of this. And then he's like, okay, yeah, no, this makes sense. Okay. Everybody else on the call do this. <laughs> um, I, I remember that day, dude, that, that was insane. That, that was the coolest feeling of all time. Cause I was so fucking nervous. I was like, I'm about to change the entire process for the entire supply chain in, in the North America when it comes to processing parts, okay, in distribution. And then, and then this guy's like, why would you do this? And then just keep going down the list, like live, like a live debug of the thing we've built. We're not even prepared for it. And we're just going through it. We're going through it. And at the end, it's like, oh, yeah, no, this is, this actually makes great sense. Great work. Okay. Uh, uh, Lathrop and uh, uh, Newark and uh, you know San Bernardino, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you're taking this on now. I'm like fuck yeah, <laughs> that was a highlight. Anyway, sorry. I just wanted to give us some context for the people that I know follow this want want more context behind how this works. Yeah, good. No, yeah, all the teams definitely do stuff like that. Um, early in the in my last job, which was like quality. Um, there was like vision automation. It actually wasn't even part of quality. It was like just a part of the core automation team. But we installed cameras along the assembly lines to look for quality defects. And one thing we had to account for was people getting in the way of cameras and how they're working and stuff. So one of the engineers, um, like using vision, he mapped out like the skeletal structures of people like walking around and stuff. And we realized from there that like people were bending in weird weird ways to do a process. And we sent that to the process team that changed the process based on the data we were getting. So it's like they're all they're all tied together in some way. We all like there's no um, separation. It's like if you see something or, or, you know, you work on something and you can be like I, I changed processes when I first started working there when I was just putting door panels on cars. I'd be like, hey, like we should do this instead. Like if this process was moved over here and like an engineer would be like, oh, well, we'll give it a shot. And for two hours we trialed it and it worked. It's like, okay, all the shifts changed to that process. You know, it's like you can make stuff happen so fast over there. It's crazy. The free flow of I, good ideas is unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. Like truly, it's unbelievable. Go ahead, Hans. Not just ideas, you know, good ideas and bad ideas. Like, cause you, yeah, you try yeah. a bunch of stuff that's dumb and it doesn't work too. 
So it's the free flow of ideas. You can't say, we Correct. want the free flow of good ideas only because then you get no free flow of ideas, period. So you have to have the free flow of good and bad, and then you have to have a good process in place to separate, okay, good ones, let's amplify those and keep them moving. And then bad ones, we're just going to keep them local. A hundred percent. Yeah. Exactly right. Good. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, yeah. It's um and they're really quick with the uh like at the beginning of the Model 3 production ramp. Um they wanted everything automated. And um I witnessed like when when some of the when some of the systems didn't work, like Elon was walking the line is like why is this moving so slow? And it's like oh it's waiting for this conveyor belt or blah 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 blah. He literally ordered everybody to cut it out with hacksaws. Like that's how quick stuff can happen over there. This guy worked probably years on this project and he was literally like the engineer was sitting there like almost in tears as his entire project he's been working on forever was ripped out of the assembly line with a hacksaw because it was slowing down production. Like it is, it is nuts. Like it's, it's kind of expected that you try things. Um, and if you're not trying things and breaking things, like what are you even doing? Like we're, we're trying to make something here. You know what I mean? Like don't get too comfortable. It's the most bru it's brutal to like to the t like brutal is the best way for, like the best word I can use. It's just brutal. It's like you can JD's thing is so on point. Um and yeah, I forget I forget what 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 I wanted to jump on there. I, I wanted to give like a like a little another example, but I I don't want to like, you know, it's you know, we're just kind of like talking about the same thing over and over again. It's it's incredible. It's just the best. It's the fucking best. It's so good. Anybody who has a chance to work at one of Musk's companies, just go work. Oh, here, here was, here's what my, my thing. I wish every company ran this way. I wish the government ran this way. Like the amount of, and, and here's like, here's been my curse. This is my curse since I've let, left Tesla. I cannot help but notice just how much waste there is everywhere. And I don't know if you're experiencing this too, JD, but like, like if, if I just like, for example, I've been deep diving, uh, uh, our government, our federal government and understanding where my tax dollars go and how the government spends money. I want to rip my fucking hair out. I'm like, look, I'm like, I cannot, like I had a sense that it was inefficient. Right. But in my head before Tesla was like, well, I'm sure it's just difficult. And you know, you have, you, there's, you have to keep people happy and everything. And then I worked at Tesla for four and a half years or whatever, four years and three months, whatever the exact number was. And I get out of there and, and I just cannot remove that. From, it's like part of my being. Cause I, it's just that brutal reminder. Oh, this is what I wanted to say. The best piece of advice I ever got before joining that company was remove your ego, remove your ego, because you will, you, you will be brutalized. <laughs> you will see your baby literally torn down with, with a hatchet and in, in your face. And then they'll probably laugh at you and be like, see, this way's better. <laughs> it's like, and that's, you know, it sticks with you. So I don't know. I, I, are you, do you experience the same thing, JD, where like you just can't break oh, away yeah. from that habit? Yeah. Absolutely. It's kind of like, you know, I worked there over six years and it's kind of ingrained in who I am now for sure. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really intense. And once, uh, it's, it's actually kind of funny once everybody starts feeling comfortable, Elon will just walk in and ask people what they're doing. And if they don't know what they're doing, the whole team is gone. Like, it's like, you're always on your toes over there. Yeah. It's crazy. We, we were never, um, I feel like supply chain was like the redheaded stepchild of of uh of Tesla for so long because it's not sexy, you know. Cars, yeah, cars are sexy. Production is sexy. Supply chain is not sexy. Supply chain is ugly. And what? So we were always like, I feel like in the shadows, like shouting for attention. Like we can be sexy too. Like if we don't exist, the whole company like just like uh, like implodes. Like you don't have servant centers, you don't have body shops, you don't have parts flowing to your factories. Like pay attention. So we were, we always felt like that little brother syndrome where we always wanted to prove ourselves, you know, which was like the coolest thing ever because we felt like we were always under, we were underfunded and uh, under-resourced even more so than your typical Tesla like process where like the factors are already lean. But like supply, dude, like when I say we had rocks, r sticks and stones to build stuff, I literally mean we had sticks and stones to build stuff. But I think in the end that ended up being a blessing in disguise because it proved, it proved to us just how much you can get done with so little.
with so, so little. And I know you've experienced the same exact thing, but dude, I have that little brother syndrome. Like anytime I talk to someone, like, you know, I know you worked in, in, in the production or whatever, and I'm like, you motherfucker, you have no idea what we had to go through. <laughs> you guys had it good, you know? Oh man, good times. Okay, uh, more Carpathy here. Uh, go ahead, Han, sorry. Yeah, well, that's what I was just gonna suggest. We can go back to that now. Yeah. Sorry for uh, derailing us through uh, memory no. lane. I could talk ship shop on this like like the whole podcast. Oh, me too. Yeah. So many memories there, man. So many stories. Okay. We should I'm probably schedule a Go specific ahead. episode uh, and maybe get anyone else who is a former employee that wants to come on and join the podcast and just title it War Stories and uh, dig into all the little anecdotes. Yeah, I think I think the one thing, you know, I, I, I feel very comfortable now because my I'm pretty sure my non like my non NDA stuff is up by now. I mean, I, you know, I I still want to be careful about what I talk about because there are certain things that um, I still, you know, they're not public. So I don't want to talk about them. But um, I think that would be a cool concept. War stories from Tesla from previous employees. Do this, yeah. Any the stories I have are crazy. All right, uh, you still are you still good on on time, JD? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, uh, I know you have a you have a call in about 25 minutes, so we'll go maybe another 15 minutes and then uh, just to make sure you have a good buffer. Okay, here's a uh, here's another former Tesla employee talking about Tesla bot at Tesla and like it's all the same tools and they're just like okay they're being reconfigured from a car it, like a transformer yeah. the movie they're just being reconfigured and reshuffled but it's like the same thing and you need all the same components you need to think about all the same, the same kinds of stuff both on the hardware side on the scale stuff and also on the brains and so for the brains there was also a ton of transfer not just of the specific networks but also all of the approach and the labeling team and how it all coordinates and the approaches people are taking. I just think there's a ton of transfer. What do you think are the first application areas for like humanoid robotics or human form stuff? I think a lot of people have this vision of it like doing your laundry, etc. I think that will come late. I don't think B2C should be the right start point because I don't think we can have a robot like crush grandma is how yeah, I put yeah. it sort of. I think it's like too much uh, legal liability. Yeah. It's just like, I don't but think like that's a the right approach. Hug. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just going to fall over or something like that. You know, like these things are not perfect yet and they require some amount of work. So I think the best customer is yourself first. And I think probably Tesla is going to do this. Uh, I'm very bullish on Tesla, if, if people can tell. Uh, the first customer is yourself and you incubate it in the factory and so on, doing maybe a lot of material handling, et cetera. This way you don't have to create contracts working with third parties. It's all really heavy. There's lawyers involved, like, et cetera. You incubate it. Then you go, I think, B2B second. Uh, and you go to other companies that have massive warehouses. We can do material handling. We're going to do all this stuff. Contracts get drafted up. Fences get put around, all this kind of stuff. And then once you incubate it in multiple companies, I think that's when you start to go into the B2C applications. Mm -hmm. I do think we'll see B2C uh, robots also, um, like Unitree and so on, are starting to come up with robots that I really want. Yeah. I got one. Yeah. You did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the G1. Yeah. So I will probably buy one of those and there's probably going to be an ecosystem of people building on those platforms too. But I think in terms of like what like wins at scale, I would expect that kind of a mm -hmm. approach. I, but in the beginning, it's a lot of material handling and then are going towards more and more HKC things that are more specific. One one that I'm really um, ex excited about is the Nat Friedman challenge of the leaf blower. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like I would love for an optimist to walk down the street, like tiptoe down the street <laughs> and like pick up individual leaves so that we don't need like leaf blowers. Yeah. And I think this will work and it's an amazing task. And so I would hope that that's one of the yeah. first applications. Or just even raking. Yeah. yeah, that should work too. <laughs> just yeah. very quietly. Yeah, just yeah. quiet raking. That's cute. They, uh, I mean, they do actually have like a machine that's working. It's just not a human, right? Which is Instant reaction, go. Who wants to go first? I'm going to go first this time. Should I? If full self-driving works, how can this not be the greatest thing of all time? Like, so we have, we have, we have the thesis, right? Th this was not that difficult, right? It was not that difficult to transfer from car to bot. Cool. If car works, therefore, bot works, right? And if bot works, how is this not the greatest technological thing in the history of humankind, where you make labor into a utility, just like water, just like internet, just like oil and gas in your house, where everybody has access to this incredible 
life-changing thing for really low cost, right? And everybody has access to it and it's provided to you by the jurisdiction that you live, you know? Like, uh, uh, imagine living without water and electricity. Just, Im just imagine it for a hot second, right? How is this not going to be physical labor? How is this in the future, like 10, 20 years from now, how is this not going to be that, the humanoid robot? It's the same fucking thing, right? Tell me where I'm crazy. I'm asking the wrong people, but tell me where I'm crazy. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, you're asking the wrong people. I, cause I completely agree. And I don't think the, the, um, the, I don't think people appreciate how generalized Tesla's approach is. Like we've seen somebody in Europe uh, hack their Tesla car to make it think it's in the United States and use full self-driving version 12 in Europe. And it drove around with zero disengagements. You know what I mean? Like how mind blowing that is where it's just um, it's bananas. And just like you, you said, you know, if it's the the all that knowledge will be transferred to the bot. So as it's walking around, it's going to actually like already know what to do and how to behave and walk around the streets and not get run over because it has all that data already. And it's a very generalized solution. And I think that's um, what we're seeing a lot of is like narrow AI applications. Um, and I think um, like, for example, Waymo does have obviously some type of AI in their car, but it's a very narrow approach compared to what Tesla is doing, where they can just literally take the brain of the car and put it into a robot and it'll walk around and like look for what it thinks like just like Carpathy said it's been years since he works there but he's looking for drivable space because it knows kind of like oh this is where i can walk this is where i can't walk all that knowledge it already has without any additional effort the one thing i would say to push back on this idea a little bit is just that while fsd transfers like if you just think about driving as a challenge that humans face, well, that's only a very small and structured and narrow set of the overall number of problems that humans face. And so, yes, it transfers and you get that maybe locomotion piece, you know, the, the moving around part for free, but there's still a lot of challenges left to, to solve, but that, kind of gets into his point about you incubate this technology inside of another domain that is narrow and structured and specified. And so that's where you, you know, you use it in your own factories on known tasks that are repeated and, and you build this up. And so I think it's going to be a progressive, like vertical by vertical expansion of what the bot can do. And it'll be you know, a combination of what's lowest hanging fruit of something that is easy to expand the use case of the bot to that's very repetitive, that also is economically valuable. And so the things that are the easiest to do, the most repetitive and the most economically valuable to do will be the first things that it will do. And then you'll just kind of expand in concentric circles out from that. And so it's going to be, you know, kind of a long, I think, slog before we have like, you're not going to have your AI robot friend who is relatively indistinguishable from a human for a long time, you know, in my opinion, I think it's much more likely that you're going to have like, you know, fleets of street sweepers and robot workers at the factory and like the attendant who stocks the grocery shelves and like those types of things. And those will be, you know, all different types of, or like, you know, they'll have distinct software running on each group of those, those robots. Um, and then we'll just continue to build out over time, all the things that are covered by, by those things. But it's still coming at some point. Yep. Yeah. So it's just a matter of time. It's just like FSD. It's the same exact thing as FSD. Who else is doing this at, at this scale with this level of expertise? You know, we, you got figure, you have, uh, what was the other one that I just saw a video from? I forget. There's a bunch of different ones coming up now. Yeah. There's the Neo by, I think it's one X and that's an American company. Then yeah, there's the, the Unitry ones that are the Chinese companies. There's a bunch of people that are working on this. And I definitely think that the Chinese companies are going to be really at one of the forefront 
manufacturers of these because they'll have scale. They've got the support of the government. This is a national priority for China, both for economic reasons, like major economic reasons, since they have a major looming, you know, population collapse crisis. Um, but then also, this is going to be a core technology that is going to decide advantages in the just military space for in the competition between the United States and China. And so they're extra super motivated to really pour a lot into this. Um, and so we'll see, you know, massive developments in China on the humanoid robotics front as well. Um, and that is something that I think China will also want to be a leader in if they can, it's just real world applications of robotics. I think that they have structural disadvantages and challenges to be a leader in like pure digital artificial intelligence, like LLMs. Um, just because if you think about somebody like Xi Jinping, who has a real hard time allowing tech billionaires like Jack Ma to even exist, much less say like normal things in public. Um, well, okay. If he wants an LLM, what do you train that LLM on? You can't train it on all the publicly available data on the web because all of that publicly available data on the web is biased towards saying that CCP is a shitty communist dictatorship regime. And that's, you know, an absolutely unacceptable piece of knowledge to bake into the weights of your large language model. So that makes training LLMs if you're inside of the CCP and you want to use this as a tool of the government, very, very challenging. Um, but that said, you can do all sorts of real world AI applications that don't interface with any of those pieces of data. And you can build a lot of powerful products and, um, and technologies, and you can kind of avoid and sidestep some of those ideological and philosophical challenges that they might have in other areas. Anything from you, JD? Okay. Crazy. Uh, I know we're coming up on time. I'm going to make sure you have a good buffer. Uh, any parting words before we wrap the sucker up? JD, any, any thoughts? Putting I on think... The spot. Uh, yeah, I think in the next few months, we're going to see some serious shit. I love it. Yes. Yes, we are. Yeah, and we like we truly are. I think the fact that there's so much competition around this human or robot space starting to pop up competition. I, I use the word like there's so many different companies attempting to bring this to the forefront it says two things. Number one, AI is here to stay for sure, without a shadow of a doubt. And number two, it's very obvious what the first true AI products that are profitable are going to be self-driving vehicles, human or robots. It's it's as clear as day. Those are going to be your first two real AI products that will also have a economic uh, use case. Like you actually have an ROI on all those NVIDIA chips that you bought and all that inference compute that you bought. That's the way I read it anyway. I think whatever that new coding AI thing is that everyone's talking about using, including Andre, is actually probably the real first one. Um, okay. Because I think that company is going to be super in the black. Yeah, that's and fair. Kind of that, that's sense. purely a software. That's a software piece, right? You don't have any hardware tied to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, JD, where, where can people find you, man? You make such great content. Where can people find your stuff? Uh, I really only post on YouTube. And if you find my content, I mean, I do post some clips on X, but um, I'm also very popular on TikTok, although I've never been there before. So, uh, yeah, I just say How are you uh, popular you on TikTok. Me, <laughs> I just my videos get stolen so much. It's in, it's insane. Um, you know, and I figure I could spend my time like trying to to submit copyright claims or I could just make new content. So, you know, I, I choose the latter every time. AI driver on YouTube, AI driver on X. Okay, so you know what's interesting about what you just said? The fact that there's so much uh, attention on TikTok, isn't that a signal? That your, that your content gets ripped off so often? Like, content that gets ripped off by default means that there's an interest to it, right? 
people are interested. Oh yeah, for sure. There's definitely a huge interest in um, around self driving, especially in China. I feel like it's um, it's a big thing. You know, they they release a lot of um, demo videos. Uh, they're all you know mostly sped up and stuff. And I don't know exactly how they work. I, I have a feeling um, that they're using a similar approach to Waymo. And when they, but I think they have a better understanding of like the, the technology behind it. And then when they see Tesla and full self driving doing what it's doing, you know, wherever they want, you know, they don't have to go travel to specific areas to get a robo taxi ride. They're watching people get in their own cars and drive on their own property and on their own streets doing all this stuff. It's kind of crazy to them. So I think um, we're going to see another huge event happens. It says, what is that? Q1 of next year, um, FSD in China. I think that's going to be another big moment. I agree. AI driver, JD. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. We should share Thanks more for stories me. in the future. Really appreciate of it. Course. Oh, yeah. As yeah I, got a lot of, I got a lot of Tesla stories. Oh, boy. The stories I could tell. <laughs> if the walls could talk. <laughs> Dude, can I play you a video while we wait for JD? Let's do Check it. Check this out. Oh, my God. This is so bad. Did you see this? I didn't watch it yet. Can I play for you? Do it. Can you hear it? All right, here we go. <laughs> We're going to tag them again. <laughs> That's gonna crash the entire economy. No, you ain't got a hundred million. <laughs> huh? No, her plan would crash the stock market. That hurts working people. It hurts everyone. No, you complaining? You ain't even got a hundred million, bro. Bro, why? Well, because you think you gotta pay the wolf down, bro. You don't got a hundred million, bro. Bro, you don't understand. My concern is that forcing the best performing stockholders to sell off twenty five percent of their earning shares would completely crash the market forever. And all we stand to gain is enough to pay for less than one percent of Kabbalah's proposed budget. Bro. Yeah. I don't get it. You don't got a hundred million, bro. No! You, you don't know you don't got a hundred million, bro! No, you don't you got a hundred million! Okay, the, be the best case scenario. Best case. It raises enough to fund the government for less than three days. Three days! That's what you want to risk the entire economy on. Three days of revenue. Bro, you understand? Bro, wait, listen. Oh, I'm telling you. Bro, you, you went? No. Listen. Bro, I got a hundred million. Bro, 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 that one percent What are you not understanding? This has consequences for the entire economy. You have to know what All the capital's gonna move, and we have the largest stock market in the world. Do you understand that? Economists don't like this idea. Do those economists got a hundred million? No, they don't. Dude, that should have me die. <laughs> dying i was dying <laughs> oh my god it's so funny it's so and it's so accurate that's the saddest part of this whole thing it's, it's like so you lived accurate. that or something yeah dude it's so fucking dude when i made that one post uh i'm crying i literally that's exactly what i saw exactly it only impacts people with a hundred million net worth i'm like how is this so hard to understand you guys <laughs> How many you know? of the things that you buy are somehow owned by someone who has a hundred million dollar net worth yeah. or more? Do you Welcome want any to of that stuff anymore? Exactly, dude. Oh my god, I dude, I, I was laughing for ten minutes straight. I I watched this video twenty times already. <laughs> Every time I watch it, it gets funnier, dude. Fuck man. Yeah, that's seriously the X experience right there. Like, it really god. is. It really is. It's unbelievable. Okay. Ooh, I want to watch it again. I'm going to, I'm going to try not, try not to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Hans, go for it. What's your, uh, what was your, what was your question for, for JD? Uh, 